Good afternoon, uh, everyone who's joined for this webinar for the 100,000 Strong in the Americas initiative through the Innovation Competitions. Uh, this is Matt Claussen, uh, Senior Director uh, for um, the Innovation uh, Net, uh, the Innovation Fund, and I'm joined here by uh, Jackie Carter, who's our uh, program officer, by Mark Farmer from NAFSA, by Lee Tabluski, the director of the uh, of the Innovation Fund, um, and we will also be joined uh, by two guest presenters, uh, Randy Bird and Ash uh, Shader Black, and we are looking greatly forward to having uh, an engaging session. We have um, over 100 participants, so we won't be opening up the microphones for questions, but we do encourage um, you to type questions through the chat box, and we will address as many as we can at the end of all of the presentations, uh, and we will address those that we can't get to as part of the Q&A that we will publish for the current round. Um, before passing the uh, floor to Jackie Carter, I do want to put in a, an incredible thanks to uh, Santander Bank, Santander University's network. Many of you are members of, of that network. Um, this is the second year of, of a multi-year partnership um, with Santander, uh, and their contributions to these efforts have been critical. They came early on in the initiative, and also they provide tremendous flexibility for proposals um, in any country in the Western Hemisphere and in any field of study. And we'll be talking about tips uh, and other sources of guidance for engaging through this competition today. So without further ado, thank you for joining us, and here is uh, Jackie. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. Um, Lee's going to start the presentation for us. I just wanted to let you know, um, if you encounter any problems, please call Citrix Support at 888-621-0537. That's 888-621-0537. To respect the time of all the participants, we don't want to stop the presentation to answer questions about individual audio or visual, visual connections, but please feel free to call the support line. And I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, it's really great to see um, 100 people on the call here with us. Um, we're going to try to add uh, because there's still people that are uh, asking to join us. Um, having 100 people on the call um, indicates the level of interest. Um, when we ran this competition last year, uh, we had um, 153 applications. And we expect that there's going to be a significantly larger number this year. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to encourage the best that you can do. And I think that by showing up at this webinar today, you're making a commitment to do the best you can do. So let's go on to the next slide. This tells you who we are. And the last slide will have our email address. Um, so we're going to talk today about accomplishments, momentum, and give you some tips from what we've learned. Here's Mark. Here's Mark. Hi, Mark Farmer. Mark Farmer from NAFSA. Thank you guys all for joining us. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of where we are on the numbers, the 100,000 Strong in the Americas initiative has a goal of sending 100,000 U.S. students to Latin America, the Caribbean, and Canada, and receiving 100,000 students to the United States. As you can see, uh, right now we are sending from the United States about 45,000 students as of the latest Open Doors report, and we're receiving uh, just over 70,000, about 72,000 students from uh, the rest of the region to the United States. So the initiative is focused on increasing those numbers. Um, and as you can see, the there's real need to increase U.S. students studying abroad, kind of in general, but specifically in the region. The concept behind the Innovation Fund, the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund, is one of leveraged competition. And so we'll talk about it a little bit more and so give some examples um, of what we mean by that. But the basic idea is we want to provide 
innovation leverage grants to uh, institutions of higher education that will then use that money to spur greater investments from their institutions, but greater resources from their institutions, from the private sector, look for uh, matching resources from local businesses, uh, other corporations that they partner with, foundations, uh, kind of third party money. And then on a, uh, and then also look at some of the policy changes or institutional curricular changes that you can make on campus to really make the money uh, go further and ensure that students beyond that first year who may receive some uh, a travel stipend or some sort of scholarship uh, money from the grant will then continue to be go on, continue to study abroad in years two, three, four, five, and on. Uh, so as we have here, uh, we want to new exchange partner program partnerships, we want to build strength in the Americas, uh, focus on innovation at the institutional level in individual programs and departments uh, within the study abroad office or the international student office. And we want to engage uh, higher education institutions as a system for uh, innovation. We've done a lot, this is Lee again, we've done a lot uh, in a short period of time. Um, this uh, initiative um, is a joint effort of the Department of State, NAFSA, and Partners of the Americas. Uh, it was presented uh, publicly at a rollout um, about a year ago, almost a year ago today, um, at the U.S. State Department by Secretary of State John Kerry and uh, Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, since then, we've had a thousand institutions of higher learning across the Americas, and that includes Canada, Caribbean, Latin America, and the United States, um, have joined the Innovation Network, and we have almost 3,000 individuals representing those, those institutions who have joined the network. Uh, 420 institutions have applied for grants uh, in partnerships from 24 countries. And uh, we expect that that number 24 is going to increase uh, and probably get some proposals from Central America where we've been light and maybe even from Cuba. We've awarded 38 innovation fund grants uh, to 109 higher education institution partners from 12 countries. Um, we've gotten in the door. This is not an unfunded mandate. This, that was one of the concerns when this was created by President Obama, is he didn't want to make an unfunded mandate. Um, this is a public-private partnership, and uh, we, we have raised, uh, Partners of the Americas manages the innovation fund under an agreement with the state and with NAFSA, and we have raised four and a quarter million dollars for grants. Um, we've given away more than a million dollars uh, in, in the first year, and the proposals that have come in, um, we are telling other foundations and corporations um, who are going to join and support this, we're going to have more, many more rounds, uh, that we have seen 150% return on investment for every dollar that we give to uh, higher education institutions. They have matched and, and matched again by half. Um, what we have put in. And typically we, we put in $25,000 uh, per grant um, to, to each partnership that wins. So we've also found an interesting number um, that for each $800 that's invested um, on our side um, allows a student to study abroad, either in the US or in one, one of the countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and we believe that this will start producing systemic changes uh, and allow greater future uh, numbers of, of students to move uh, on out years where uh, you don't have a grant from us. Uh, in particular, um, we believe strongly that um, the, the, the well-worn paths um, of study abroad uh, from earlier years, uh, particularly uh, to Europe and now um, to, to some places in Asia, um, will continue to be very attractive. But Latin America, it, when people get to know the story of Latin America, the quality of the education and the outstanding receptivity to students, um, that it's going to grow like, like wildfire. We just finished a competition, and all the competitions are basically the same. 
we have uh, a request for proposals um, or a, a document that outlines what our expectations are for a proposal. Um, we open the, the round and allow people to submit questions and answers for a period, and we answer those in a transparent way so everybody can see. Um, and people will get about six to eight weeks uh, to um, work with their partners and to submit a proposal by our deadline. Uh, the last one was supported by the Coca-Cola Foundation and was open to higher education institutions in the countries that you see. One of the things that we have found is that um, corporate sponsors um, have um, uh, interests in uh, thematic areas uh, and in particular countries, which makes the current round supported by Santander Bank and the uh, Santander Univer Global Santander uh, Universities Group uh, really important because you're not limited to English, you're not limited to economics, you're not limited to forestry. Um, you, can, you can do anything and I encourage uh, people to even submit in health and nutrition. I, I think that we may be able to award um, uh, another award in, in the health and nutrition area as well. Um, that This past air, um, round was focused on obesity. We um, had 35 uh, applications and we selected seven winners. Okay, uh, going to the current competition. Um, Competition six is open to all fields of study in all Western Hemisphere countries. Uh, it's open. Um, you access the information um, from the 100,000 strong americas.org website by, by clicking educate and then um, apply for a grant. Um, the question period is open until the 29th of January. There is a form that when you click on apply for a grant, you'll, you'll see the link um, because we want to get everything in the same format and, and organized. Those will be up uh, available on the same website on February 5th. And the uh, competition is, itself will close, it will close on March 6th. So it's, it's not too early. You, 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 you need to be working with faculty, with the international office and with your partners now. So you'll see on the 100,000strongamericas.org website some uh, examples of the past winners. The, this is, the, as we said, the second round that's been funded by Santander Universities and Santander Bank. So if you look at competition three, for examples of previous winners, that can give you um, a good idea of where to start. Okay, we've the, the people here in the room have had a lot of experience reading a lot of proposals now. Our eyes are hurting. Um, but we've been very happy because the quality of the proposals has been very high. We've learned some things um, during that experience over the past year that we wanted to share with you that we haven't shared anywhere else. Uh, one is that you, you should spell innovation with an I, not <laughs> started with N-N-O-V-A-T-I-O-N, but that's okay. Um, we have 11 tips here. Uh, applying for a grant, um, a, a button will bring you to the page that talks about um, this competition. It will also give you a link at the top of the page to join the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Network. I really want to underline the importance of joining the network because that's how you're going to get information about this round, about future rounds, uh, about what's happening um, with the winners, um, about uh, information from the State Department, NAFSA, the White House. Um, it's a really important thing to do and, and more than one per, uh, per institution can register. Okay, read the mission of the Innovation Fund. Um, it's, it will be found in the RFP document and on the 100,000strongamericas.org website. Submit the questions, uh, answers will be posted by the 5th and contact your, your partner institutions now. I mean, that I, it's never too early to start contacting partners. They don't have to be new partners necessarily, but we want to see a deepening of a relationship and, uh, and, and, and some kind of a new initiative. This is the thing that we've been told takes the longest time. And we really think that the proposals that we've seen that have been the best have brought together both faculty 
and administrators from an international office um, to analyze the RFP and um, put together put together a team. And um, we strongly suggest that if you're a faculty member and you're not in touch with your international office or there isn't an international office uh, in your at your institution um, that you contact the uh, the administrator that that is uh, in charge of that area so that you can collaborate it makes things a lot easier um, choosing a partner um, particularly when if your your proposal is innovative um, we want to know how it's innovative uh, we want to know how it overcomes barriers that, that you and your partner have found at your institution. And we want to know how it leverages the strengths and outside resources that you can bring to bear, as well as how you're going to make it sustainable. We don't do drive-by philanthropy. We want to see this grow and prosper and, and stay as a continuing uh, part of the academic landscape, sort of like the GI Bill. Um, read the formal application. You'll see it online. Uh, and make the key decisions. How many students do you think that you'll be able to mobilize uh, during the first, second uh, years? Um, so that's, that's important to the, the transparent panel of judges, of independent judges that, that will be reading these, is you know, what's, what's the impact of admittedly a small grant going to be? Jackie. All right, so next, um, as Lee mentioned, make sure you take a look at the RFP and follow the guidelines in it. So it's a 10-page proposal, and that's something that's been constant throughout all of these rounds, and those do not include any of the annexes. But the annexes are very important. We're looking for strong letters of support from the partner institutions that you're working with, maybe something like the resume of the person that's gonna be in charge of the program, um, references from any partners with NGOs, with corporations, um, and just make sure you include any of the information that you think would be helpful for us to, to make your, um, to make the case for your proposal. And also, like I said, when you're looking at the RFP, uh, to follow the budget format. This has something that's been uh, a little a little difficult with some of the incoming proposals because if it's hard for reviewers to to read or understand what's being presented to them it's a lot easier to uh, get a, a lower score for it and also um, one of the last steps is completing the application form and for those of you who have opened it we ask you a series of questions about your university and your study abroad thus far these are going to be treated confidentially with um, the review panel it's just kind of stuff for us to get a, a good idea of where you're going and what you're doing so far um, and make sure you keep those answers too because um, in the future, we'll, we'll be coming back to them and we'll be making sure that they match what it says in your proposal. And the last step is just to upload your proposal as one PDF. And um, that's it. Okay. Um, um, Mark. So I just said one of the, the neat things about this initiative is that we don't want to tell you what you have to do on your campus to increase your mobility of students. You guys know your campus, your students, your programs, your strengths uh, much better than, than we will, than we can judge. So we're looking for whatever is, is best for you that's gonna have the biggest impact. Uh, and this page has just kind of brief descriptions of what some of the some of the winning proposals have done and how they've been innovative. Uh, I'll highlight two of them. Uh, one is the the University Intercultural Maya de Cantana Roo. Uh, their focus, there's a very small institution in Mexico that their focus is on minority and disadvantaged students. And they're really building from scratch, building from the ground up their international office. So that was what they, what their institution needed was very base level, um, capacity building to, to build the national office and start building partnerships with other institutions. Uh, one of the other one that I'll highlight is the Northampton Community College, and they were one of our first winning institutions. And their proposal was very unique in that it 
connected service learning with a study abroad uh, component for community college students, which is coming from a community college is rare in and of itself. Um, but along with building that, that service learning component, a part of what they're using the grant money for is to then make some institutional policy and programmatic changes and so that future faculty that have ideas on, we want to build this kind of international program, uh, they now have, or after this grant, they'll have kind of some structures and some policies in place that'll streamline that process and allow for that that greater growth in study abroad at the institutional level, even beyond this one innovative service learning uh, program that they got funded for this out of this initiative. So the last thing that we'll talk about before we turn it over to Randy and Ash is the evaluation criteria for the for the proposals. As you can see on the screen, the 80% of the proposal is the technical proposal, and that's what is the what is your program doing? And so that's broken down. 40% is the program description. As Jackie mentioned, it, we need this. It's very helpful if this is a very clear and concise description. We know which program, how you're doing it, what the discipline is, how the students are moving, when the students are moving, uh, what direction they're going, kind of describe how the program's going to work and why it's important. What is the the innovative piece to it? Why is this better than the other programs? And what, what is this kind of the, the crux of this proposal in the program description? The sustainability plan is how is this going to make changes on campus that is going to allow this program to be sustainable beyond the life of the grant? So we don't want to just fund one program that's going to send 10 students for one year. We want to fund a program that's going to be long lasting, that's going to send students in years two, three, four, and on, and that ideally will not just send students on that program, but because of the, the curricular changes you made or the policy changes or institutional changes, um, similar to what uh, Northampton was able to do, that you're going to send students on other programs in years out as well. We want to incentivize that kind of thinking and that kind of uh, the ability to make those changes on campus. The next one, institutional capacity and the management approach. This is your, we want to know, are you able to fulfill what you say you're going to do? Do you have the capacity to carry out the proposal? Uh, do you have the faculty that can lead it if it's faculty led? Do you have an international office that's able to uh, form the partnerships and, and take care of the students? And how are you going to manage the, uh, the grant and the proposal? The last one in the technical proposal section is the monitoring evaluation plan. Uh, this can be oftentimes overlooked, but it's still very important. We need to know how are you going to track? Are you successful? What are your metrics for success uh, at the end of the grant? And how are you going to look at that, both in the terms of are the students learning what they're supposed to be learning? Are they gaining cultural understanding? Are they gaining, if it's an engineering program, are they gaining the technical engineering skills that they need as part of that? And then also, are you sending, so kind of from the student side and then at the institution side, are you sending the number of students you are supposed to be sending? Are you meeting the deadlines that you're supposed to be meeting? Those kind of things on the monitoring and evaluation plan. And finally, the cost proposal is, this is where you have the budget and you have a budget narrative that's going to describe how you're spending the money. What are you spending the money on? Uh, why is it important? And this includes the grant money, the $20,000, $25,000, whatever the, the, the grant total is, how that's going to be broken out, and any matching funds that the institution or a third-party provider is able to uh, provide that you've uh, secured for this grant. And that's taken into account is how much matching you're able to, to provide. And then also the, the last thing on that is the indirect cost. How much of the grant money is going to be used for indirect cost and overhead. And so those are the um, kind of the what we're looking for as we're evaluating it. 
Okay, well, I, I just, this is Lee. Um, in closing, um, I'd like to, to thank uh, Mark from NAFSA, our colleagues from the State Department who are also on the call, Jackie and Matt from Partners of the Americas, and the White House. Um, this really is a presidential initiative. The president was with us in May for 40 minutes uh, talking about this. Uh, the vice president talks about this. The assistant secretary and the secretary talk about 100,000 strong in the Americas, and all of our embassies uh, in the region talk about this as well. This is the, the keynote educational initiative in the Americas of this administration. I'd also like to, to recognize um, the donors that are listed and the donors that I haven't listed that um, have also agreed that we're going to be announcing in, in coming days. We're uh, organizing on a quarterly basis um, rounds, so um, you, can, you can count up uh, and, and figure out probably from uh, when we open this round, uh, when we'll be out opening the next rounds, and we'd love to see you there. Yeah. there there's our website. Um, there's um, our our, our hashtag and uh, see us on Facebook or write to us um, at these emails. Um, I'm L. Tabluski at partners.net. Mark is Mark F. at nafsa.org and Jackie is J. Carter at partners.net. Um, so Jackie, I'm going to turn this back over to you now. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Um, now I want to take this opportunity to turn the presentation over to Randy Bird from University of Arizona, who is joining us today from Puebla, Mexico. And Okay, Randy. Okay, I'm just going to show my screen here. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Well, welcome uh, everyone and thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Randy Bird and today I will uh, discuss several strategies for developing and shaping a uh, competitive proposal for the 100,000 strong grant competition. I'd like to start today with a brief outline of the areas that I will discuss. First, we will look at the goals and critical areas that I believe should be addressed in the proposal. And next, I will provide some tips and strategies on proposal writing, and this will include operational and uh, management strategies. Uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, a, a plan should be proposed as how you uh, intend to operate and manage your, your project and collaborations. And this will also demonstrate that you have a plan for a successful project. I will also discuss how to expand the program and the program impact and discuss the importance of network and data management. There's a lot of reporting in this proposal and there's a lot of movement and mobility and there will be some reporting and management needs. And finally, my colleague Ash Black uh, will provide some examples of how to manage data network and how to leverage and scale the, the impact. When developing proposals, it is always important to stay focused on the goal. In the case of this grant, the goal is to promote prosperity through exchange. So the, the final outcome is prosperity and the tool is mobility. So stating in how your project will increase mobility and ulti ultimately uh, lead to prosperity is important. In other words, 
if you increase mobility, how will you increase uh, impact? And what impact uh, will be uh, the, the out outcome? I have uh, also identified uh, three critical areas that I believe are uh, important for building a successful proposal. Innovation, leverage, and cooperation, and I think uh, these were, were clearly articulated in the uh, presentation uh, earlier on. And uh, also, all of these, uh, because all of these are, are critical, uh, we'll discuss them each individually and uh, also in detail. Let's start with innovation, uh, which is perhaps the most important uh, criteria for the proposal. The uh, call for proposal listed several expected results, so I believe it'll be important to link uh, the innovations and the program structure to the results. Uh, one focus of the uh, uh, proposal is the elimination of, of barriers. So it will be valuable to not only state the barrier, but what is the barrier that is specific to your program? And how will uh, your program remove that uh, barrier? For example, financial barriers are a common barrier for students, so including small grants or stipends uh, that could alleviate financial burdens uh, and permit the student to travel would be uh, important and valuable. I also in, uh, anticipate that this particular uh, competition will um, uh, be very competitive. So a traditional study abroad program will not stand out as uh, innovative. Uh, it will be important to, uh, to show how you will build uh, some type of uh, engagement. Earlier on, it was mentioned uh, service learning uh, was a, uh, a novel innovation that uh, won an earlier award. So I think including service learning or research into the program uh, will be very valuable. Also, I think uh, uh, diversity. Uh, diversity will be very important to uh, uh, include. Some type of diversity plan will be important to include in your, your program. So uh, uh, therefore, choosing a, a partner with a uh, diverse student body uh, can also uh, add to your program. I would also specifically state your diversity plan in, in the proposal and if there are any barriers or uh, policies that uh, interfere with uh, diversity or mitigate diversity and how will uh, these barriers overcome and uh, be permanently changed. And then finally, how can you create or design a program to be sustainable? So describe how you will create a financial structure that will be uh, both self-supporting and scalable. The next critical area is leverage. The call for proposal proposals indicates that there is uh, an expectation that the uh, proposal will maximize uh, the funding impact. Again, this was uh, mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, there are several ways to, to accomplish this. Um, uh, uh, first, uh, I think that um, uh, when, when thinking about uh, 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 scale uh, and inclusion, um, it, it will be important. How are you going to use the uh, limited resources to build upon uh, the a current program, or as indicated earlier on, build uh, a new uh, program. And again, the uh, inclusion will be important uh, because uh, there, there will always be a limited number of students that can uh, participate in mobility or that uh, commonly participate in mobility. So including uh, additional students 
uh, more diverse students uh, that are not commonly uh, uh, in mobility programs will be important. And then how long will the program last? Uh, the program must be designed to go beyond uh, the funding period. And as mentioned earlier, can you partner with a third party to increase leverage? Uh, cost sharing in the funded proposals, uh, as was mentioned, uh, averaged around 1 to 1 1.5 fold. So the amount of cost share uh, shows commitment from uh, you and your uh, other involved parties. Also demonstrate how that leverage would not happen uh, without the funding. In, in other words, the proposed project is the impetus for some sort of new development. So uh, a focus on inclusion, uh, leverage, uh, uh, diversity and commitment is uh, really the only way to accomplish uh, the challenge of maximizing impact with a set amount of, of funds. Because we are talking about leverage, uh, it is also important to mention uh, the budget component. I think building a realistic budget is uh, critical to the success of the project. It must be uh, clear that the budget is well thought out and uh, cost estimates are really important for uh, management of, of the program. As mentioned earlier, consider minimizing IDCs. I realize not all institutions can do this, but if it's possible, it's a good way to show commitment and divert money back to the students. Also plan for costs associated with monitoring and valuation, or M&E. That was mentioned earlier as well. It is important to plan uh, how you are going to implement the program and how this will be accomplished both logistically and financially. The third criteria is cooperation and networking. Having the right partners can really strengthen your proposal. The uh, proper partner can also complement the strengths and mitigate the weaknesses of your mobility program. So it's important that the student experience is also considered when you're choosing your partner. And how will the academic and uh, mobility experience be enhanced? And mentioning that and describing that in your proposal is uh, uh, also very important. With respect to the proposal, how will the partners work together? So explain uh, why there are greater strengths in that partnership and clearly articulate the value add of the uh, partnership. And then furthermore, uh, in choosing your partner, consider how you will work together. We'll talk more about this uh, later on. But uh, describe uh, a system for the integration and collection of data and its management. And uh, do you have a system for M&E to scale and also sustainability? The program, again, must go on uh, beyond the length of the program. The, uh, I like the concept of uh, this does not support just drive-by development or drive-by uh, philanthropy. And what is your system for uh, collection of data as there will be reporting and other um, uh, management needs? We're talking about partnerships, so I'd like to move uh, into innovative ways to utilize existing skill sets in your, your programs and universities and to operationalize these partnerships. So here's a common model for funding in international grants that I developed, and I modified this for the 100,000 strong competition. You have your university prime and academic partner 
and an, indust an, an industry partner or a third party, all focused on a mobility project. And there is usually uh, a particular hemispheric destination in mind. And this is usually focused on a, a grand challenge and some type of field, for example, a, a STEM field. And, a, <clears throat> and an interesting uh, component of this uh, could be the uh, cost share or an economic development component, uh, e either utilizing each of the academic, uh, the prime or the partner, but uh, utilizing the industry partner can also be a, a big value add and add to that uh, leverage. So looking at this, uh, what this what this demonstrates, it's it's very difficult to organize all the requirements and a single faculty member or department uh, cannot act alone on an opportunity like this. So integration, uh, as was mentioned earlier, with your international office or uh, other expertise in this field will be very helpful. And uh, uh, also in your proposal, propose a system to manage uh, the project and partnership. So a management plan uh, has to be included in a uh, competitive proposal. So as I indicated, uh, the international or hemispheric grant space is becoming increasingly complex. You know, the single investigator or single department concept uh, will, will not work. It needs to be integrated with uh, the, the other offices uh, in your university. Uh, you know, for example, there is uh, a need to uh, mobilize quickly. How do you find out about these opportunities? Uh, also, you need to know your institution. What are the institutional expertise? Who has them? And who are the faculty? that operate internationally or are involved in mobility. And you also need to know your partners. Uh, what are your partner's interests or strengths? What are the synergies? So knowing all this uh, will, uh, allows you to express this in the proposal. And it will also allow you to leverage and build on uh, existing strengths. And you have to uh, manage and network uh, these collaborations and, and also the data that are, are generated. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, the, you must have a network. Uh, it's the only way to uh, realize the potential and not only integrate with your international office, but integration with the business office is, is also important. Operational-wise, uh, uh, again, uh, you need a system in place uh, to work with your partners uh, and, and your office. Who are your partners? How will we work together? Uh, how will this be managed in, in post-award if you get the grant? How do you manage the, the reporting? And what about the continuation uh, and expansion? So these, these uh, ideas uh, not only are involved in the proposal preparation, uh, but expand beyond uh, the, the program life. So here's an example of how our team manages proposals. Uh, we're equipped to facilitate collaboration across the three most critical phases uh, of the research development process. I call these the uh, discovery phase, the uh, preparation phase or the pre-award phase, and the post-award uh, phase, which really involves uh, managing, uh, uh, managing the awarded project. So in the discovery phase, it is really important to uh, integrate your current personnel uh, and resources into uh, the, the uh, proposal building. One example uh, of an innovative approach to the program development is to incorporate the most knowledgeable people that you have in your institution about uh, student mobility. So utilizing a study abroad coordinator uh, and selecting a partner or helping with the budget uh, can, can be very um, uh, helpful. We also like to link data to the process. We collect different types of data in, in, into a, a warehouse. We aggregate the data. 
And then this allows for a, a smart process rather than a, a passive pro process. So with the data warehouse, we can not only leverage, leverage existing data, but uh, new data. The pre-award, the next stage uh, of, of the uh, award process, at this point you are preparing the proposal and again I recommend you spend time with your, your business office. Uh, this is a stage of preparing documents, configuring details of the partnerships, and writing the proposals. So there is a great need to work together and gather the various proposal pieces. I would also like to mention that there's a sub-phase, uh, I call it the transition phase, where you're notified of the proposal, but you're required to make modifications to the technical or rebudget, uh, basically moving from uh, the project phase to the, uh, or project development phase to the uh, post-award phase. And you should consider how you will work together at this point. You're going to have to have a shared or virtual workspace. How will you share documents, forms, templates? Linking the data from the discovery phase to the pre-award phase can only facilitate this process. Uh, in other words, do you have access to CVs, the MOUs, the MOAs, institutional data, and so forth? In addition to the data warehouse, uh, a shared workspace is useful. Uh, here's an example of a platform that we use to work together and interface not only internally, uh, but with our partners. And there are actually many free uh, platforms. This is one that, uh, that, that, that we use, but uh, there are many available. The key, though, is to just develop an interface where the researchers and the collaborators can work together both efficiently and remotely. You're going to need to communicate throughout the life of the project and the development uh, uh, process, including the uh, management phase. So developing some type of platform earlier on is helpful throughout the life of the uh, proposal. The last phase I'd like to talk about is the uh, post-award phase. It's, it, this is also an important uh, part of the project. So uh, considering how the project will be managed. Uh, the project may be handed off to other uh, departments, either internally or externally, so you must prepare a plan as to how you will manage this uh, internally and externally. And again, make sure uh, your budget has either some sort of a structure proposed or resources mentioned or budgeted to uh, deal with once I get this award, I have to manage it. And again, uh, connecting this uh, uh, to the uh, data, it, it makes it more of an automated uh, process. It helps in the management, reporting, and dissemination uh, of the results. And ultimately, if you establish this, it can help in generation of, of reporting and expansion. Okay, so the, uh, propose, proposal, the proposal strategies uh, that I, I described here rely heavily on innovation, leverage, and cooperation. These elements must be evident uh, throughout the proposal and keep in mind the goal, mobility leading to uh, prosperity. It will be important to utilize and establish a good network and good network operations uh, to design and implement the proposal. And in the future, I believe that this data-driven network will be very helpful in project dissemination and scale. So as this is a geographically oriented project, with movement and mobility, it creates an opportunity for data collection and visualization to demonstrate impact. And uh, even though this includes the uh, proposal development section, Ash will now take a few minutes to talk about how these multi-institutional networks and the international space can be coordinated and uh, become a linked process. And uh, please feel free to contact me or Ash while he gets set up. Thanks, Randy. Um, 
I think that, that I need my screen to be shared. Great. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Great. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Ash Shader Black, and I work with Randy Bird here at the University of Arizona in the Office of Global Initiatives. And the, the work that uh, Randy was talking about and my role in it is really focused on the application of data science and data science techniques and methods to um, supporting this the the discovery and the pre-award and post-award phases of the proposal development. Also, we work a lot with the uh, the study abroad office, as Randy was t talking earlier. You know, mo student mobility and in some cases faculty mobility, really important. Uh, a lot of growth in that area. So, what I'm going to do briefly is kind of walk you through and share a little bit of what we've learned to do in the last couple of years um, in in applying data science to um, pulling together more innovative projects. Uh, and, and briefly, I'll, uh, uh, I'll touch on um, some of the elements that Randy was just talking about, understanding the research landscape and the opportunities, understanding your own institution's strengths, and then uh, finally pull it together with an example of an applied visualization. Um, I think that the it's a short video. Uh, it's a temporal, spatial temporal animation, actually, of a, the growth of a mobility network, uh, which I think will be of interest. Um, Finding funding opportunities, they come from, from all over. We're, we're fortunate to have um, a, a research office that pulls together lots of opportunities for us. So I don't need to spend much time on that. But we, we will, when we see an opportunity, use a couple of tools that are readily, that are available to the university. You may be aware of these tools. Um, for example, one is called Pivot. Pivot is a more or less text-based uh, search engine for understanding um, faculty expert, ex, base, basically expert strength, uh, and and um, their kind of research profiles. So it's a good way to get your head around um, the complex, um, all the, all of the capabilities of your faculty at your university. But a more interesting application, I think, uh, is one that you may also be aware of. is called SciVal from Elsevier. And this is uh, an interesting application because what it does is it, it takes a truly big data approach to understanding um, e experts uh, across the world, and it does this by doing a deep data mine of its own Scopus index, which is a, a publication database, and it does a full text index. Um, so what it, effectively what that does is it identifies researchers around the world and at your university um, by the very words that they use in their own papers, and so it, it basically is intelligently aggregates them by research topic, and so it's a really cool tool for being able to find uh, research expertise in areas that may not be on your radar. Um, SciVal does that. And you can see that there's a visual component too. You can see relationships between between uh, experts. But that's kind of a, a researching the landscape of opportunities and experts. The thing that you that we found we needed to do was to understand our own institution. Um, we use spatial visualization um, to make it easy to communicate um, uh, or rather to, to see into our database um, where our expertise, where our contacts are, where our partners are. Uh, for example, this map here that we're looking at is a visualization of our office's contacts database. It's uh, relatively large. It's been growing for th many, many years, and it's up pushing uh, 30 or 5,000 contact records or so. The neat thing about it is that it's all tagged geographically. So um, I think Lee earlier had, had uh, mentioned uh, that, for example, uh, industry-funded opportunities are increasingly thematic and in scope and geographic and in focus. Um, and so you can see how you can how you can leverage data uh, uh, data intelligence to. Uh, focus on areas where you know people, or at least to see who you know in those areas when you're looking at a particular geographic area, and then you can use tools like SciVal and Pivot to, to narrow down the, um, the thematic scope. So it's really about using um, data tools to get at, to look through large amounts of data quickly and to see patterns. Uh, quickly, but briefly, this uh, slide here is a distribution of our international partners. So this is a great way to communicate 
in our own office, like, well, you know, we've got something interesting happening in, in Brazil, so we can pull up the map and we can say, well, look at our institutions in the southern part of Brazil, and you immediately go in to look at them. It just saves a lot of time and it allows the imagination to run a little bit, you know, better, and that's what we're talking about when you're trying to, to um, enable innovation. You want, to, you, want the, you want to play with things and let your mind run. So th um, this slide here is an example of, of something that's happening uh, with our travel registry, which is basically, I'm interested in looking at where people from the U of A go. Haven't really turned it into, um, uh, I haven't really leveraged it yet, it's, but it's something that's being developed. In, in other words, where in the world do we actually actually go? Not just study, but where do we spend time? Um, but I'd like to show you this video that um, Randy, well, that I uh, spoke about earlier. Um, it's a spatial temporal visualization of the growth of a um, of the of an organization's network. This is CONAHEC. Many of you may know the Consortium of North American Higher Education Collaboration. Um, great organization for facilitating collaboration across Latin America and uh, possessing a great data set. So what happened was that uh, I came upon this data set and realized that I had many many thousand points of information f collected from um, Konehek's previous conferences going back to 2002 and realized that there was a fine temporal resolution meaning we knew when people had signed up and we had a fine geographic resolution because we knew where they were from and so uh, we wanted to apply the spatial temporal uh, technique to visualize make a picture a movie really of the growth of that network and I'll play that for you now um, so I'll get over to our web's our page and run this video for me. And I hope that this plays well for everybody. So this is an application that uh, was authored here. It leverages Google Earth, um, but it also controls Google Earth from the outside, so it's not just a Google Earth. Um, app, it's a spatial temporal database. What you're looking at is conference registration data. Uh, these are all attendees. You see the lines moving across uh, North America and Latin America here. These are basically uh, individuals or groups, clusters of individuals who are attending Konehek conferences. You'll notice up here uh, the time is running, so it's a temporal animation. You can see the growth of the network over time. The large circles represent the conferences. Um, this large one in front of us was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, 2005. Now it's um, as the conferences, uh, as the t as, excuse me, as the time rolls on, you can see the development of this thick mesh, this network, overlapping uh, networks, and it starts to come out become obvious to the eye without having to do statistics and math, you begin to see the strong connections. You see the strong institutional linkages, which, which parts of the world often go to these conferences together. You see uh, a lot of, at, I'll just point out that at the, at the end of every one of these lines, you can't see it here because the, the camera's moved out so far, but there's, you can sort of see it here, there's a, a, a dot. Those dots represent institutions that are attending the Konehek conference. You can go into this application and you can, of course, right click on the, the, um, the dot and get at the institutional information. That's the whole point of this. It's, it's a neat picture and it allows uh, a lot of people, I think, to participate in um, speculating or, or understanding the nature of the growth of this social network. But it also drives you to the data, and that's that's the neat thing about it is that the, the it's it's data driven, and the, and you can actually find the people at the end of those points, and the people at, and phone numbers at the end of those dots. So, at this next slide here, um, the movie. This what this is is it's um, basically I just ran kind of a simple algorithm that subtracted the noise from that network that we just saw, which gets at the heavily concentration the the people and the organizations that have participated the most over the 14 years that the, of the data, data set. And I will run it again so that it's running in the background. Um, the, the idea behind that is that um, you can use you know, some math to, to find a pattern, but then the pattern is visible to all of us, not just 
mathematicians and database nerds like me that you can you you can put this information out there for a, a much wider audience and people can have their own interpretations and then, so I'm going off a little bit here talking about how great I think data visualization is but um, that is really I think really the promise of it is that it allows us to have um, a non mathematical appreciation of data sets that aside, um, I really appreciate having your time here to, to, to take a moment to, to show you this and share this with you. And um, I think it's very exciting that this could, could and should be a technology, I think, for visualizing mobility networks. Um, it was, you know, things evolve now. Where everything's evolving very quickly in the technology space. When we started out, the idea was to discover uh, you know, the top 17 people who, who would be the backbone of the network, but then it very quickly morphed into something that I think um, could, could, tell it, could, could tell very interesting stories about student mobility or faculty mobility. So, um, yeah, that's the presentation. That's the video. Um, and I hope that that, um, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it made some sense and um, gave you some idea of where we think data science is taking um, how, how it's it's impacting this space. Thanks very much, Ash, um, um, Randy. Um, it's let me make sure that I'm on here. Change presenter uh, to. This is not my name. This is this is our, our technology and university uh, guy here. Um, uh, so. Um, we will have, we've made a recording um, of uh, the presentation today. We, we've had uh, several dozen people who tried to, to, to sign on, who have not been able to sign on because um, there was a limit uh, arbitrarily of 100 people on this, this, um, this webinar. Um, we will be sending out information. We have your email addresses. We'll be sending out how to find this information uh, as well as the PowerPoints. And we look forward uh, to communicating with you through the Q&A system about the current round uh, or by email directly to us uh, if it's a general question. And I just I'll, I'll leave the, the, the last couple of words to Mark and Jackie. Uh, I just want to, on behalf of NAFSA Association of International Educators, uh, thank you guys all for participating. And we very much look forward to receiving the proposals and seeing the innovative, fun, exciting ideas that you have on how are we going to increase mobility in the Western Hemisphere. So thank you all. Yeah, and again, this is Jackie. Thank you all so much for joining us today. As Lee said, everything's going to be available online, and we will be following up with uh, some emails and more information. All right, thank you. See you on the internet. Bye-bye now. <laughs>